Hello and welcome to the first set of notes for what is unit 12 and 13 on psychological disorders or abnormal behavior and the treatment of those abnormal behaviors or psychological and mental illnesses, right? So in this first set of notes, we're going to talk about and kind of introduce mental disorders and mental illness and what that looks like as determined by what's called the DSM. And we'll get that down and being really a major understanding that you need to take from these notes. So again, I'm Mandy Rice. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Please make sure that you subscribe. You'll be able to find these notes on my Teachers Pay Teachers store, which is linked below. So let's go ahead and we'll get started. So I give you a quote, which is from the textbook that we use in my classroom, um, which is kind of just giving you a glimpse of what it is um, to live with a psychological disorder. So this is from Mark, who was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and again, it's an excerpt from, from the textbook. I felt the need to clean my room and spent four to five hours at it. I would take every book out of the bookcase, dust and put it back. At the time, I loved doing it. Then I didn't want to do it anymore, but I couldn't stop. The clothes in my closet hung exactly two fingers apart. I make a ritual of touching the wall in my bedroom before I went out because something bad would happen if I didn't do it just the right way. I had a constant anxiety about it as a kid, right, as a child, and it made me think for the first time that I might be nuts. So we'll talk about this more in um, another set of notes, but the the um, abnormal connection you could say between his ritual of touching the wall and it solving a problem for him is what makes that an abnormal behavior and tendency. Approximately one in five adults in the United States, and you'll see why I kind of tell you this, that's 4.43, sorry, 43.8 million people or 18 and a half percent experience mental illness in a given year. This is all from um, NAMI.org and I very much recommend that you check out their website. So approximately one in 25 adults in the U.S., that's 9.8 million or 4 percent experience a serious mental illness in a given year that's substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. So this isn't a unit to learn about just because you want to do well in the AP exam. Although, of course, that's important for your life right now. This is important for your life, not just for an AP exam. To understand that one in five adults are experiencing something like this in a given year. Um, another important thing to note is that many disorders like depression and schizophrenia exist in all cultures of the world. So this makes this unit a, a pretty popular one, um, or at least one that a lot of people have interest in because it's just so prevalent. It's just so applicable and need to know information in our culture today and not just our culture, but worldwide. So what is abnormal behavior? Why is it so important to define abnormal behavior? Well, in a way, haven't we all behaved, quote, abnormally before? And you might be asking, well, yeah, but what makes it disordered? That's a key question to ask, so stay, stay tuned. And who says, another important question, when our behavior is abnormal enough to present a danger to others or ourselves and therefore requiring detainment? At what point do my civil liberties, right, so bringing in some law there, um, at what point are they compromised in order to save myself or someone else, right? Those are really important questions to consider. So you don't necessarily have to have this all down. Um, it, I mean, it might be important to you, but you certainly don't have to write down all of this. But there are some major takeaways that I get to at the end. But it's important for you to kind of see that the American Psychiatric Association in the DSM-5 includes the following criteria for labeling behavior as disordered. So again, there'll be some key things that I bring your attention to. So it's a behavior or psychological syndrome or a pattern that occurs in an individual, and it reflects an underlying psychobiological dysfunction. So the consequences of which are clinically significant distress, so painful symptom or disability, and an instance of this is an impairment in one or more important areas of functioning. And that's what I want to bring your um, attention to a couple of things is that there's dysfunction and there's distress. 
Now, these must not be merely an expected response to common stressors or losses, right? The, like the loss of a loved one or a culturally sanctioned response to a particular event, like um, a trance state in ri religious rituals. And the last thing I want to bring your attention to is that it's primarily a result of social deviance or conflicts with society. And that's kind of strange to think of deviant behavior, right? It's not someone who's trying to do the wrong thing necessarily. So we need a little more clarification on that. This is where you really should be taking notes and understanding the four D's, also a U, in defining um, disordered behavior. Okay, so deviant is actually is actually an important one in that it goes against the norm of behavior. Now, what may be abnormal in one culture could be normal in another. So um, it's got this one makes it culturally determined. Um, distressful is another important one, meaning it causes the person or others distress. It disturbs them, right? And that they have some, not necessarily anxiety, but there's a little anxiety and turmoil, you could say, over this behavior they're having. It's dysfunctional. It must cause dysfunction in the person's life, their daily life, and that it alters the functioning of their daily life. And then dangerous is a possibility as well, and that there's a possibility of causing harm to themselves or others. And finally, unjustifiable, and that there's no real reason why this behavior should occur. And that's like what it said from the APA, and that it's not just an expected response, no matter how erratic it might be, for example, to a major stressor in life or the loss of a loved one, something like that. A topic that I want to bring up here is one that you will have to do a lot of research on, not a lot, but some research on yourself or in your own time is that on attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and that there's a lot of research around um, this, not mental illness, but it's definitely a developmental um, occurrence that's happening in a trend on the uptick in our culture and that um, children namely boys are being diagnosed with ADHD and so when a child and their parents right a parent brings their child to a doctor um, kind of looking for or what they think might be this diagnosis the doctor needs to go through and see okay this child is a young boy right and they're already at a higher level of um, hyperactivity it's just a thing. Um, so, but at what point does it then become abnormal or deviant from what is normal for the average, let's say, seven year old? But a big one being, is it causing dysfunction in the child's life? Is it impacting their education, let's say? Is it impacting their relationships at home? Um, could it potentially be dangerous to themselves? And of course, distressful. Does the child have some distress? in their hyperactivity or in their attention deficits. So again, those questions being asked in particular to ADHD. Now it's important for you to understand the history of psychological disorders in that if you think there is a stigma today, which of course there very much is, again, you can kind of do some, some looking around on that, but um, we've come a long way and if and you've got to kind of consider the history so ancient treatments of psychological disorders include what's called trephination trephination is pictured here in that it was boring holes in the skull um, to remove evil forces of patients of psychological disorders right so things like exorcism being caged like animals beaten burned castrated mutilated and transfused with animals blood because they were seen as almost demonic or possessed because there wasn't any scientific research or understanding around what it was for the mind to be ill. So for the first time with Felipe Pinel, we see from, in, from France, um, what is the medical perspective and that we get away from this kind of demonic, almost like religious aspect of evil forces being involved to looking at it from a medical viewpoint. And he insisted that madness, psychological disorders, was not due to demonic possession, but an ailment of the mind. And so from that, um, with a lot of other contributors, we have what's called the medical model in that the medical health movement where mental illness needs to be diagnosed on the basis of its symptoms and cured through therapy, which may include treatment in a psychiatric hospital. It's not something to get out of the person. It's something to treat just like any other physical ailment. 
And that's what the medical model kind of gives us. The biopsychosocial approach, which you see this in many, many topics, assumes that these three parts, biological, social, cultural, and psychological factors combine and they interact to produce the psychological disorder. So you'll want to kind of zoom in on these to see what are the biological influences, the psychological and the social cultural, and that it's a combination of the roles and expectations in your culture, in your situation that matter, as well as the stress and trauma you may have dealt with in the past that's psychologically impacting you, as well as your genetic predisposition and the biological influences. Again, all really important and interact and influence each other. It is important to kind of rewind your brain a little bit and get back to unit one when we talked about perspectives and understanding what they have to say about abnormal behavior. Psychoanalytic, which we talked about a lot in personality, believes that psychological disorders stem from those unresolved childhood conflicts, right? Um, and that they believe this about personality too. So to understand the roots of the disorder, you must look at the person's early life history. What was going on in childhood? What was kind of repressed into the unconscious mind? Behavioral. Remember, think of those buzzwords, and with behavioral, it's learning, and that's exactly it. They believe that behaviors are learned responses, and when we get to um, the later part of this unit in treatment, we really talk about the behavioral aspects and how behaviorists treat things, especially anxiety disorders with phobia, obsessive compulsive and related disorders, really interesting stuff. So to understand the disorder, you must analyze how behavior has been learned and what reinforces the continuation of that behavior. What's going on that makes this person think I should do this behavior again? So think of that in terms of a phobia with fear, right? What's making them have that fear again and again? Cognitive, think thinking. So this believes that cognitions, thoughts, and beliefs are the root of psychological problems. And that would mean irrational thought, right? Illogical, not correct thinking. And the only way to, quote, fix behavior then is to change those thoughts and beliefs. Um, and I think this is you'll come to see this as being more and more applicable the more we, we talk about these subjects and that thinking really does impact how you um, approach a situation and just changing that thinking changes a lot. Humanistic, right? These are kind of the hippy-dippy ones um, believing in self-potential, right? So believes that people are responsible for their own behavior even abnormal behavior. So the focus is on the relationship between the individual and society, how people view themselves in relation to others, and believe that disordered individuals don't have self-worth. They have things like conditions of worth, worth placed upon them, etc., and that's impacting them in such a severe manner to cause abnormal behavior. Sociocultural believes that abnormal behavior is shaped by family, but not just genetically, right? By the situation, society, and culture. So one's relationships with others can support and even cause abnormal behaviors. And the stresses one encounters in life can influence the disorders they have or don't have. It's all about the situations, the cultural pressures, um, and the norms of culture that impact abnormal behavior. This is super duper important, probably the most important understanding you need to take away from this set of notes and that classifying psychological disorders completely comes from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the most recent edition being the fifth one that was released in, I believe it was 2012. 2012. Um, so the DSM-5 describes 400 psychological disorders compared to 60 in the 1950s right? So just something to consider there. Um, the American Psychiatric Association rendered this manual, right? And I kind of have it down for you there. Make sure you have that jotted down, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders to describe psychological disorders. And we'll talk about why that's important. So the sections of the DSM include kind of an introduction to the book and how it's used, super important for psychiatrists and psychologists, um, diagnostic criteria and code. So that's where you have the list of the disorders um, and what makes someone classify under that disorder and then emerging measures and models, meaning how to go about diagnosing the disorder with certain measures and assessments. 
The goals of the DSM being to describe those four disorders, helping um, doctors to 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 diagnose them, right, and indicate how prevalent the disorder is as well. Um, disorders outlined in the DSM-5 are reliable, um, thus diagnosis by different professionals are similar, right? And that's important And that when you go to one doctor and then see another one that it's similar and therefore is a reliable and consistent measure of abnormal behavior. So it keeps all doctors on the same page. Others um, might criticize the DSM for, quote, putting any kind of behavior within the compass of psychiatry, um, just kind of something to think about and that um, we're just looking at behavior here. So, um, and how does that indicate measures of the mind? Okay, it's important to consider labeling and what it means to label a psychological dis- disorder and the person behind that psychological disorder. Um, we're going to talk about this more in my classroom, but I kind of bring up just some some important things here. And that critics of the DSM argue that labels can stigmatize individuals by assigning arbitrary conditions and value judgments. And that just because this one person is experiencing these symptoms that I see here as categorized in this disorder, that must mean that they have all the other things too, and act like all the other people who are also labeled this way. An important piece of research, a major piece of research that you should know about, hence why I put the star here for you, is Rosenhan's experiment on, um, he published it in an article called Being Sane in Insane Places. Rosenhan and some of his um psychologist buddies I believe Martin Seligman was in there too I'll have to double check on that don't quote me Um, but there were other well-known psychologists involved as well Um, they feigned f-e-i-g-n-e-d feigned or faked psychological disorders by going to psychiatric hospitals right mental institutions and admitting essentially admitting themselves saying and the only symptom that they said they had was that they heard the word thud in their head, right? They, it, it's, it wasn't actually happening. It's just they heard the word thud. They all said this at various different psycho, psychiatric hospitals. So that's why it's also known as the thud experiment. Um, and every single one of them was admitted, some of them not being allowed out for months, right? And put on medication, um, being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So his research just showing you um, – maybe some unreliability, right? Some um, issues in the psychiatric treatment world. Um, And there is a lot of criticism of that research, but it's important for you to know about Rosenhan's research. Another interesting part of labeling psychological disorders is essentially the insanity plea. Insanity labels raise moral and ethical questions about how society should treat people who have disorders and have committed crimes in that Um, Should someone who is labeled as insane or mentally ill be able to be convicted for the crimes that they commit? Um, This man, known as the Unabomber, I mean, you can do some research on him too. He bombed various locations of universities and airports, hence why the media news outlets called him the Unabomber. So Un for university and like the A being kind of like the airport. Um, And he hurt a lot of people, killed a few as well. Um, All of his lawyers and multiple psychiatrists said that he was mentally ill, but he denied the insanity plea. Even though he totally was and would have um, gotten treatment probably if he took the insanity plea, but instead he did not. Um, but it's just kind of interesting in that um, when when taking the insanity plea, that person is then treated differently than someone who's not, um, even though the same crime was committed. And there's a lot of, lot of controversy around that. Labels, however, can be helpful for healthcare professionals and that they are helpful for healthcare professionals when communicating with one another and establishing therapy, right? And talking about best practices and what's going to help the person and that having that label allows them to treat what it is that person is experiencing. So understanding the categories, there are lots. And ever since um, the DSM-5 was released, 
um, we've had some changes in AP Psychology, according to College Board, to kind of catch up with the DSM-5. And so um, you'll see these categories um, in various sets of notes. I try to combine some of them so that we don't have a bajillion sets of um, notes and videos coming for you. Um, but stay tuned and you'll see more of these. Um, the next one is going to be anxiety. And I talk about that with um, obsessive compulsive and related disorders as well as trauma and stressor related. Um, so all of those used to be encompassed under anxiety and that's not the case anymore. They are separate categories. And then finally, I leave you with this. You'll want to pause and kind of look over it. I got this again from NAMI.org, and I highly suggest checking out their website and looking at the prevalence of mental illness. And this is kind of how I started the slides as well. Um, but you can look in that 1.1% of adults in the U.S. live with schizophrenia. 2.6% of adults in the U.S. live with bipolar disorder. And that we're not just talking about something to do well on the test. We're talking about people's lives. And it's important to understand what is going on in their minds just as if you were talking about what's going on in the life of a cancer patient the mind can be ill just like the body can be ill and so we need to treat these people as human beings and help them seek the treatment that they need and deserve so stay tuned for our next set of notes on anxiety and obsessive compulsive related disorders we'll catch you next time thanks <music>